hero movies have been losing their edge. What happened to the grit of hero movies? Marvel movies are quips fighting clones of themselves somehow hasn't changed in the last decade. While I enjoy the odd Marvel movie, I expect different and more. DC is now rebranding itself, so who knows if that will be good or not. My hopes are there, but who knows. Where are the great superhero movies? Where's the grit and the edge? But not like Nolan's edgy Batman movies. I mean, like, where's that Raimi Spider-Man trilogy power that we've come to lose during this last era? <laughs> Well, Kamen Rider does it again and comes back to save the superhero market yet again. Shin Kamen Rider is the 50th anniversary special for the franchise, directed by Hideaki Anno, the, the Eva guy, you know. Under his direction, we are given a darker and bloodier portrayal of the masked grasshopper man. The reimagining of this movie focuses more on cults than it does fascism. This movie starts with Hongo running away from members of the Shocker clan with Rukia until they are able to make their escape. We learn that Hongo was forcefully transformed into an Og. Rukia's father had given this to Hongo to fight Shocker because he believes in Hongo's gentle spirit is a strength that they need. And he cries a lot in this movie, like a lot, a lot. Hongo then kills some grunts to protect Rukia, but this weighs heavily upon him. It's so bloody, he bursts people's skulls open, he drives his kicks to their core, his body is covered in blood. It's incredible. Maybe this is the slasher fan within my heart of hearts, but I love something about seeing people covered in blood. This might be a red flag for people. Oh well. Rukia then gives Hongo his famous red scarf. Heroes always wear red, and he was already covered in it, so why not add more? Hongo is haunted by the death of his father. A man with so much compassion that when he was shot trying to de-escalate a hostage situation, while he was dying, he just kept asking how the civilians were doing. Hongo curses himself every time he fails throughout this movie to be the hero he wants to be. A man like his father, not this man that kills. He despises what he does, and he wants to do better and live through being like his father. To be compassionate, to love, to be able to put the weapons aside and say, I forgive you. But Hongo can't do that. He sees himself in the action and he gives in to his power and kills. And this doesn't sit right with him at any point. Spider-Man, or in this movie, Spider-Rock, appears and fights Hongo. The professor is killed and Hongo, once again, begins to feel isolated more and more as he's dragged into this alien world that he doesn't really understand. He can only but grasp the task that has been given to him to fight Shocker, to protect Rukia. And he's uncomfortable with the more he has to kill. But at this point, he doesn't know what to do, so he joins forces with Rukia to fight Shocker, who, as says before, has rebranded from a 1940s German party to a cult about happiness. They are much more based upon the happy science cult instead of those funny Germans in their weird hats. Am I really going with that? Yeah, we are. It. <laughs> their goal being the same as Shocker's, the, the two cults, to bring happiness to humanity by spreading the truth. Of course, what truth is just depends on the person we're talking about. The Happy Science Cult is also a political party that tries to expand the Japanese military, support the use of nuclear deterrence, and deny several massacres Japan did to China and Korea. So, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, pretty bad, Pr pretty bad. How does Shocker compare? <laughs> you know, it's pretty bad when we're comparing something to Shocker, because you don't want to be compared to Shocker. <laughs> Well, they seek happiness by indoctrinating everyone into their cult. They have military weapons as seen by the AUG program that they use. They don't talk about nukes or massacres, but I feel they still work as a similarity. The entire point is how like they kind of force people into this cult and then they can't leave and we watch as people sacrifice themselves for this cult. Both creators of Shocker and the Happy Science were both starred by well-off individuals, but Happy Science leader Ruya Okawa claimed to be the reincarnation of God, so yeah, they're a bit crazy cult. I don't feel like calling them religion because I don't think they deserve such satisfaction. Constantly throughout Shinkamer, we are shown how they use force and literally brainwash people for them to stay. Ruki is the only willing person to escape from the cult, and it's shown throughout the movie that Ruki has been traumatized by this experience. She's afraid to make human connections with anyone, and she's afraid it's a ploy to take her away, anyone that's nice to her. Her friends and family are all psychopaths who wish to play with human lives because they see themselves as executives above the common masses. Her brother seeks destruction of all humanity because that's how he thinks he can save them all. 
But as she points out, the heaven that he has described is a literal hell that no one can escape from or find joy. Ruki begins to make connections and see that not all people are awful. After Hongu convinces her, after taking many, many beatings, Hongu and Rukia, then on the run, meet up with some JDSF agents who try to help them stop Shocker because the government wants to get rid of them too, for good reason. <laughs> Thus, the movie begins with Hongo and Rukia going to stop a Shocker agent, try to convince them to surrender, fail, Hongo then kills them. This is all big fun action sequences. If you've seen 2004's Cutie Honey, a lot of the action sequences are similar but performed a lot better here. It uses a lot of exaggerated action shots and CG to create this bombastic action sequences that I adore. All of these ages Rukia knew, and while she doesn't want to show the pain that she's feeling for their deaths, it's obvious how much it hurts her. You can see it when no one's looking. You can see the pain on her face. But at the same time, while she's struggling with accepting that they can't change as much as she wants them to, she can't save people that don't want to be saved. And it breaks her. One of these agents, as she put it, was the closest thing she had to a friend. Wasps. And when Wasp dies, it breaks Rukia's heart because she doesn't want to see her friend go. Even if they become such different people, she still cared about her till the last moment. It's also at this point we learn why Rukia gave Hongo his scarf. It's because her father used to wear when he went riding with the family, and she sees this symbol as a symbol of love and family. On entering the butterfly's domain, enter Kamen Rider 2, who poses the first of the Henshin movie, and it's great! <laughs> They fight and we learn that he's been brainwashed by Shocker because of course, and they free him of his brainwashing, but in the process she's killed by the chameleon dude who's invisible and he's he's just as goofy as he is in the original series and it's great. But the, don't worry, the chameleon dies to Ichimongi, aka Kamen Rider 2. I hope I pronounce his name right because I am not doing that take again. <laughs> Hongo, with his broken leg, drags himself to Rukia, and while she's able to give her will to Hongo before she dies, dissolving, leaving behind only a red scarf. Hongo and Ichimongi, after some convincing, go to face the Monarch Butterfly. Upon entering, they are faced by eight evil Kamen Riders, probably more, I forget how many, honestly. And there they have to fight their way through to stop the Butterfly Man. All the while, Hongo is being pushed to his emotional high point where he becomes the compassionate hero he always wanted to be. He is at peace with himself and he knows what he has to do. After killing all the evil Kamen Riders, the two riders face the Butterfly Man, who transforms into Kamen Rider Zero with a blue aesthetic to contrast the heroes green and black. Now, Rukia's brother was wearing all white and has giant butterfly wings in the throne room. He appears so heavenly and I felt like this similarity between him and Ruyo upon seeing themselves as gods. Kamen Rider Zero fights Kamen Rider 1 and 2, and it's an amazing fight sequence, the ending with Hongo sacrificing himself to finally redeem Ichiro, and they both die better men. To use one's power to save rather than kill is what it means to be Kamen Rider. Ichimonji. Ichimonji then takes up the mantle of Kamen Rider to fight Commander Hell, but that's not shown in this movie, but I'm excited. So that's Shin Kamen Rider. Ano said he wanted to do a sequel following the final chapter of the original manga, calling it The Masked World, but he's taking a break after working for the past 30 years, and I don't really blame him. In many ways, it's a great adaption, but it feels like a massive love letter in both good and bad ways. Some of it feels like it uh, needs a little longer to develop, and it's way too much lore explanation for stuff. You should watch it. Oh yeah, Hongo has chakra now? Like and subscribe, it really helps out. I really appreciate when y'all do. And I know when you did. See y'all for some uh, power sentai or something. I don't know, dab. Bye.